Hi YouTube, Muchismo Eugene. Today I want to talk about not going to counseling with the narcissist, not going to church counseling for any type of relationship issues you might have if you are members of a church, you and the narcissist. Um, this is when you become aware that some of the behavior after studying and having it revealed to you that you're possibly involved with a narcissist. Uh, as I said before, don't consult, don't even bring the matter up as to you think you and them should go to counseling. It's a waste of time. It's also going to end up being you or the crazy one. You're going to be the one that, in fact, the, the narcissist pits the therapist against you because most therapists I believe have no clue about this because they have book knowledge but they haven't actually been involved with a narcissist uh, uh, and as a result been abused and I just believe that that is the stark difference in knowing about the disease I don't want to say disease the disorder that's the stark difference in knowing about narcissistic personality disorder through academics and being actually first-hand recipient of the abuse by way of a narcissist. And I'll drive my point home with this. When you learn about something from a book, let's say the Bible, you grow up your whole life being taught the Bible. You come to a point in your life when some of the things that the Bible speaks of began to become evident in your life, such as a miracle that you may in fact attribute that situation as being a miracle because it's unexplainable. You have something to compare what you've read and been taught by way of the Bible to what you have experienced. Now, some may imagine certain things be small or large as a miracle. Say, almost getting hit by a car and you barely, uh, you barely escaped getting hit by a car. Some would say that was a miracle. Some people would pass it off and just say, I was lucky. Luck and a miracle are two different things. Luck is you believing you saved yourself. A miracle is you believe something intervened that didn't involve you. Now, the comparison to the miracle and the Bible, meaning You've been taught something out of a book, you've read it, now you've observed that behavior or that thing demonstrated or something that resembles the miracles uh, that the Bible speaks about. Even healing, your health coming back to uh, normal, you can attribute it sometimes to a miracle. And first you have to believe in the book in order to embrace those things that you actually now are experiencing. Some of us don't always see that as a miracle. Let's say getting out of a relationship with a narcissist with your life. That, in my opinion, is a miracle because there are people right now today, there's a whole world of people that are involved with a narcissist who are being berated, they're being broken, they're being torn down, they're being physically, emotionally uh, abused. And we see it now that we're awake, but the person that is in it don't doesn't see it. They know that they're being hurt. They know that the person is tearing them down. But they attribute it to everything under the sun, but the one thing they don't attribute it to that this person, in fact, is a narcissist. And 
How do they know they were the narcissists? Let's say that you reveal it to them nonchalantly. It's a friend of yours and you say, hey, I think you probably do with narcissists. All of this behavior you're saying that they're demonstrating. And uh, here, come read this. Look into this. You'd be hard pressed to convince someone to even embrace the concept or even the idea that they're involved with the person you're describing. Even though they are experiencing this thing that you're describing. This is one of very few things in our world that you are hard pressed to convince somebody of. And I use the analogy and the comparison of reading the Bible, being taught the Bible, growing up and then experiencing some of the things that have happened out of that Bible, such as a miracle. Why is it that we cannot convince easily or persuade the average person to even what I initially said, not go to counseling? Say your friend, you see as you're awakened now, and I'm always speaking in the, in the tense that we're awakened now, we see something that most of the world has no clue about. We see it right in front of us. This friend, let's say, you say to this friend as an awakened empath or chosen one, hey, I think you're involved with narcissists. And they tell you, the friend tells you, the victim tells you, uh, well, we're going to counseling. We're going to go to counseling next week. And you in turn say, don't do it. It's going to be a waste of time. Most often, you would be hard-pressed to convince this person to cease and desist, to pull the plug on the whole idea of counseling. Because you've just enabled them and armed them, you've just armed them with the, with the knowledge that of what they're dealing with. Now comes the point of them embracing it, accepting it, believing it for what it is, and going forth and making the decision not to do counseling or whatever the situation is. Now, the reason why it is one of the things in our world that is going to be very difficult to persuade somebody to not go into counseling or cease and desist or pretty much exit, get the hell out of there like the house is on fire, is because by design, not only that the narcissist has incubated you from the reality that you already are aware of, they have pretty much convinced you, persuaded you that the thing that you're now being told, which is the reality, is not reality. That is something of a, of, of, a, of a mystery, but it's not. Now, that situation I just used, we may be hard-pressed to convince people not to go to counseling, but anyone listening to this video, now you're that person that I was just describing, that are hard-pressed to accept that friend telling you, no, don't go to counseling, don't go to your pastor. Don't go to your friends and talk to them, hoping that they're going to help fix your situation. You're on this channel, you're watching this video, because all of those other scenarios that I just mentioned that you are not having any part of it, brings you to this part that you can't accept. I'm someone you don't even know. I'm someone you've probably never seen in your life. I'm, a, I'm just a random person that you just happen to come on a video and see talking about something that resembles what you're going through. You've had friends tell you this. You've had loved ones tell you uh, this person is no good for you, to which you wouldn't have no part of that. You didn't want to hear it because you used excuses. Mama don't like him anyway. Daddy don't like him anyway. They never liked him. This is your day of reckoning. Don't go to counseling. Don't go to your church pastor. Because a lot of times in a church, the churches are blind. And if it's a hypocritical church, which a lot of them are, and what I mean by hypocritical, they're not just 
going home as a saved person and doing some things that somehow missed the mark. They are wretched and ratchet right in front of your eyes. You have people coming into the church looking for solace, looking for resolve, looking for a refuge of hope and a word that could change their life. But they're, they're observing the people coming to hear something good that could change their life. They come in and have to observe all the foolery and all the trickery and all the clown show that's going on in the church. Which is possibly made up predominantly of narcs. I've seen this church in my own, uh, in, in, in my own life. And I've visited churches that equal and rival the church before. Cynical as it may sound, which I think would just be a crutch for anyone who thinks this sounds cynical. We're all broken. We're all undone people. We're all sinners. That's irrelevant to the point I'm making now. Call it what it is. Don't sit your asses in a church when you know that that church is faking and not even making it. They faking it and not making it. You're doing yourself, you're doing yourself a disservice. Now, originally, this is about never go to counseling for the narcissist. Never. You're wasting valuable time when you should be seeking private counseling for yourself, unbeknownst to the narcissist. Trade that gym membership in. Uh, well, don't trade it in. If they believe you're going to the gym three, four, five days a week, alternate. Use one of those days and substitute one of those gym days for some private counseling. But in how you find your private counseling, this is my this is my encouragement to you. Betterhelp.com. There's a small short application or a screening uh, page. You go in and you're asked a series of questions. They actually tailor what type of counselor you need or you desire. If you're a Christian, if you're atheist, agnostic, even if you just want a counselor that don't want to talk about spiritual matters, there are all kinds of subtitles you can go through when you sign up to betterhelp.com. You go in, you sign up, and you form an account, and everything is online, everything is 100% uh, discreet, uh, you, you put your actual information in, obviously, so this is going to have to be somewhat of a transparent interaction. And once you do the initial application, you'll see pictures you, of each and every counselor. You'll see their bio. You can vet them, see what their experience and their uh, expertise is. You can read a short uh, paragraph or two about what they've done and pretty much their uh, portfolio, a small, a small paragraph of their portfolio. So you will know exactly the type of individual that is going to be dealing with you. Now this is a vetted website that I believe will yield you the best results. Now some of you might say, well you know I don't want to go online, I would like to go to an office. Well that'll be your own preference, but I'll I'll tell you this, you don't have to go and have someone sit in front of your face. If that's the, and, and I'm going to say this, I do virtual church. At some point I'll tell you what church I, I, uh, I trust and believe in. It's not in my state, but the point I'm making is, if you're that kind of person, you have to physically have these people in your presence to do church. I would wholeheartedly say that there's a lot of codependency there. Uh, even gym memberships, you know, a lot of people, they have to have their partner or their friend go to gym with them. And if they miss a day, they miss a day. If my partner doesn't go to gym, I don't go. 
we need that morale booster, some of us, and I get it. But bigger point is, being a Christian, as I am, there is no greater place to be than alone with you and just God. Especially when you're going through this valley and wilderness of recovery and healing. Am I saying in and of itself, you don't need anybody? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need the solitude. You need the alone time. You need to walk this thing called faith with fear and trembling out alone. You need to have a talk between you and God one-on-one. -on -one. If you want to break these cycles of abuse, be it family ties, your upbringing, and then the narcissist that abused you as an adult or even as a child, you have to get along with God. And this may sound like I'm churching you, but I'm speaking from my own experiences as a man you have to call it what it is except that you're broken except that you need God's hand and accept the miracles that he can provide for you we often think we need the pastor to endorse our decisions in life we're in a time right now there is very few people who are trustworthy a lot of people are good talkers, but they're poor walkers. I'm not the best walker, and I'm definitely not the best talker. But I try to embrace the fact that I need to do what I say I'm going to do for my life if I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do for someone else. I got to show and prove what I'm going to do in my life, and that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do that for myself. Because a better you can give the best to someone else. And it's a process. So that being said, bless.